Grace and peace to you, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Welcome, church family, and all who love the Lord or seek the Lord. This is St Stephen's Cumley Bank Church in Edinburgh, Scotland, UK. Our minister, George, is on holiday, so you have the dubious delights of me, Timothy Pitt, one of the elders. Please check out our website, cumleybankchurch.com, for the latest news on opening, services, and to get a copy of our weekly electronic newsletter, The e Epistle. Or have a look on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash SSCB Edinburgh. Let us come before God in prayer. When we come to adore the living God in Christ, we can be truly fulfilled, truly at peace, truly alive. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are awed by your power. We catch a glimpse of your perfection, your capacity for love, and we fall silent at the splendour of your majesty. You who created everything, on whom everything rests. You choose to love us, to seek relationship with us, and we dare address you as Father. In your love, through your compassion and your strength, you nurture us and help us grow. We declare our love for you, Lord. We confess our need of you, and we offer our praise to you. Holy Spirit, you are our wonderful counsellor. You are a gift as a bridegroom gives a gift. You dwell in our hearts and we are never alone, no longer apart from our Lord. We seek your guidance, your wisdom, your gentleness and your comfort. We welcome you in our hearts. We welcome you in our homes, the places where we go, where we work, in the world. And we seek your protection and your fellowship. Help us to flee from what is not of you to cut all ties with darkness and to embrace the true light of Jesus. Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour, our Redeemer and our Friend, you chose to lay down your life for each one of us. But first, you dwelt among us, lived our lives with us. You have been alongside us in our successes and our failures. You know what it is to be human, and yet perfect human, without sin. You have taught and guided us. You have honoured us with your love and sacrifice, even as we dishonoured you by turning our backs on you and heaping our sins on you. Through you, Lord, we are created and sustained. We are counselled and protected. We are forgiven and redeemed. Our thanks can seem so inadequate, our praise so quiet, our prayers so small. And yet, you provide for us even there. For you encourage us to come to you in unity, to worship you, and we do so now as we say together the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. This is a standalone message, the smallest possible mini-series. And I want to look at the truth. I'm going to read John 18, verses 28 to 39. Jesus before Pilate. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfil what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate 
then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. What is truth? That was the question posed by Pontius Pilate, who, by the way, was allegedly born in Fortingall in Perthshire here in Scotland. Is that a true story? We may never know, but the Royal Scots Regiment, formed by King Charles I, was nicknamed Pontius Pilate's bodyguard. Actually, in a good-natured argument with the French Picardy Regiment, over which was the older regiment, the Scots claimed to be descended from the Roman unit that guarded Jesus' tomb. Thus, the Scots gained the nickname Pontius Pilate's bodyguard. But we're looking at truth today. The Greek word for truth is aletheia. It means more than simply not lying. It means positively nothing hidden. When Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? He did not wait for an answer. Maybe he did not want an answer. Jesus, however, had already made it clear to us when he declared in John fourteen six that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What is truth? I want to show us that it is a foundation for trust in any relationship, that it is indeed an act of faith. Elspeth and I learned, and continue to learn, a lot from the Love After Marriage workshops in which we participate and run. The first lesson is entitled Nothing Hidden, and it highlights this idea that the foundation of marriage, of any relationship I would say, is openness, transparency, truthfulness and vulnerability. It was a powerful message to me the first Lamb workshop I attended and it continues to be a powerful message. What is truth? It's nothing hidden. So let's look at the journey Jesus made that brought him to this question. The immediate scene begins with the upholders of truth, the Council of the Sanhedrin. The council controlled the issues, the concerns and affairs of the Jewish people. However, they could not sentence someone to death. Only the Romans had the power to do that. Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, accused of blasphemy. Many people gave false testimony against Jesus, but their statements did not match, so he could not be convicted in this way by the testimony of others. As a result, the high priest stood up and questioned Jesus directly, which was against the rules of the court. So it was an unfair trial and not run in accordance with the truth that the Sanhedrin were supposed to uphold. Jesus' trial took place in the high priest's house, not openly in the temple court. Jesus' trial took place at night. Trials that could result in execution were required to take place during daylight, transparent for all to see. Two witnesses accused Jesus of threatening to destroy the temple, but their testimonies were shown to be false and untrue, and failed to convict Jesus. Where was the openness, the transparency, the truthfulness? Now the Roman governor, Pilate, 
was the only person who could legally sentence someone to death. So the Jewish leaders sent Jesus to him for a second trial, hoping he would be found guilty and put to death. You will recall that the Sanhedrin had accused Jesus of blasphemy. They wanted Jesus dead, and so they went to Pilate. Blasphemy was not a crime under Roman law. There were too many little gods, competing interests, and it was impossible to say which one was correct. The Sanhedrin wanted the correct verdict to suit their purposes, and in this deceit, Caiaphas unwittingly gave voice to one of the greatest of true sayings. You do not realise that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So the Jewish leaders abandoned blasphemy charges. They no longer raised a charge that Jesus was guilty of claiming to be the Messiah. Now they raised a charge that Jesus was guilty of leading a rebellion against the Roman Empire by claiming to be the Messiah. This was now a political charge, and they knew that Pilate would take notice. You do not need legal training to spot the inconsistencies, the secrecy, the deceit, the lack of truth. Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, So you say. But Jesus did not say anything about the accusations the chief priests made against him. He did not seek to counter-accuse the Sanhedrin, to plead for mercy, to claim that it was all either a lie or a mistake or, or just to deflect everything from himself. This was surprising for Pilate. He could not find a reason to charge Jesus. It's in this context, then, that Pilate came to ask his question. He asked if Jesus was the king, as if that were the reason for Jesus being there. Indeed, the reason for Jesus being. Jesus replied that the reason he was there, in the wider picture on earth, and in the more detailed scenario of being there before Pilate, was to testify to the truth. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. As I mentioned earlier, when Pilate asked the question, what is truth? He did not wait for an answer. He went out and said he found no fault in Jesus. The right answer, but without foundation. It's said that if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. And that is true in Pilate's case. Without having bothered to find the basis of truth, he had no defence against the repeated calls for the crucifixion of Jesus even though he repeatedly said that he found no basis for convic convicting Jesus of any crime, he still gave in to their wishes and handed Jesus over to be crucif crucified. So what is the answer to the question? What is truth? The answer to his question was standing before Pilate, bound and beaten. The answer to his question was able to assure Pilate that Pilate could have no power against him except that which was given from heaven. The answer to the question was Jesus. As we see in John 14.6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's go back to a few fundamentals. There's an often used statement these days that my truth is true for me and your truth is true for you. It occurs to me that these are not truths but opinions. We're called to be tolerant of others. I can certainly be tolerant of you so long as you agree with what I say. But when we disagree, we're still called to be tolerant of each other. 
That's not to say that we should just surrender all we know and, and say that the other person is right, that they speak the truth and we do not. In fact, even to have such a debate or argument over my truth, your truth, our opinions, is to jump to extremes, to absolutes. We end up arguing over whether my apples are better than your oranges. They are different. You cannot have an absolute between the two because there's something missing from the equation. My truth, your truth, our opinions. Where is Jesus in this? Your truth can be admirable. It can be appealing. It can be moral. Although we do need to ask who decides if it is moral and on what basis they judge. It can have so much to commend it. My truth can be selfish, all about me and my desires. Or I could lessen the impact a bit. My truth can be all about me as long as it does not hurt you. So who's right? Who owns the truth? What is truth? Frankly, we're just getting ourselves caught up in words now. You can be like the Sanhedrin and claim to hold on to the law of God. Or you can even hold on to the teaching of Jesus. But it's not the something of anyone. It's Jesus himself who needs to be there with you. I said at the start that truth is nothing hidden. It is openness, transparency, truthfulness and vulnerability. So what then is not truth? Jeremiah 9, 5-6 Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. No one speaks the truth. They lie. In fact, they grow weary through their sinning. Life is so much easier when it is truthful and honest. Lies lead to greater lies, and it takes all we have just to keep the deceit going. But perhaps the most telling part is at the end there. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. What is it that God wants from us? Is it our sacrifices and holy ways? Isaiah 1.11 The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? Hmm. Does God want our solemn gathering in his name to remember him and what he has done for us? I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Amos 5.21 God rescued us from our sin. He created us anew and perfect. It cost him the sacrifice of his son to do this, but he paid the price. What God wants with us is a perfect relationship. He has done everything to enable that. He has redeemed us and bridged the gap that we created through our sin. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Because there's a lack of truth, there is no relationship. Pilate asked, what is truth? But he did not wait for an answer. He turned his back on Jesus and did not build a relationship. Jesus has made it very clear to us both what the truth is and what the offer is. John fourteen six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The truth is the relationship we can have in Jesus. Jesus is the truth. He is our everything. He is the way to God. He is the relationship with God. He is the life we can have in God. So whatever the world around us may say, we have the truth, the absolute truth. John 8, 32 And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And as we start to draw to a close, what kind of truth is it? 
It's not just a theory in the abstract. It's practical, a walking in the light of life. Look at John 3, 20 and 21. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. Note the conflict. Doing evil versus doing the truth. The truth is not so much an idea, but an action. You do it. For to do the truth is to do good. Okay, we can get the idea of doing evil, but I'm saying that Jesus is truth. So how do we do Jesus? We do Jesus when we love one another, when we pursue and enjoy the relationship with God the Father that Jesus enabled for us. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. God the Father knows everything about you. Everything. And he loves you. But are you still trying to hide something from him? ashamed and tied to your shame. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Look critically at yourself. Are you open with Jesus? Are you transparent, truthful and vulnerable to him? He knows you and everything about you, and he loves you. You cannot deceive him. In truth, you can have relationship with him, I said at the start that truth was an act of faith. Jesus showed his faith in us by dying for us while we were still sinners. Plot spoiler, he didn't stay dead. Our act of faith, our act of seeking that perfect relationship with him is clear. So I ask again, what is truth? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Father God, we thank you that you speak truth, that you are truth. We thank you that you speak love, that you are love. We receive these blessings from you, the truth of your love for us, personified in Jesus. And now, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.